as we begin our study of Paul's epistle to the Colossians, um, we're going to just cover the first two verses. Paul packs a lot of content into every word, every phrase, every chapter of his epistles, and so I don't want to rush through this first couple of verses and miss how Paul is already beginning to lay a foundation for the message that he wants to deliver to this church in Colossae. Um, and so he introduces himself at the beginning of the letter in the typical fashion of a Greek letter um, where you would uh, write who you are that is sending the letter, who you're writing the letter to. Um, you would have a greeting and, um, and then go into the body of the letter. And so Paul uh, begins his epistle to the Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Um, so the first introduction is Paul. I am Paul, right? And so I don't want to go too much into the history and background of Paul. I'm going to actually create another video that's all about the life and the conversion and the ministry of Paul the Apostle. Um, and I'll put a link probably in this video up here somewhere uh, for you. And so you can even, if, if you want to now, stop, watch that video, get a little background, and then come back and watch this video. It might give you some context for who the author of this letter is. But um, he says Paul. Um, but he's not just any Paul. He's not just some guy Paul, right? He is Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be an apostle of Christ Jesus? The word apostle is in the Greek apostolos, and it simply means one who is sent. And so the word apostle, apostolos, is used to describe people who are sent with a uh, delivery of some kind, someone who is sent with a message, uh, could be an envoy, could be an emissary, um, you know, it could be a representative or an ambassador. Um, but is this the context which Paul's using it in this uh, letter to the Colossians? Um, the answer is no. Um, when Paul is calling himself an apostle of Christ Jesus, in one sense, yes, um, he is sent by Christ um, uh, to minister to them. But um, what he really is talking about is his office. Um, Paul is, in telling them he is an apostle of Christ Jesus, what he's doing is he's letting them know the authority by which he writes this letter and by which he says the things in it. Um, an apostle, in this sense, was, was one who had seen the risen Christ with his own eyes. Um, who had been chosen by Christ um, to be an apostle of Christ's church. Um, it was someone who had been given the authority directly from Jesus Christ to them um, to build his church and to, uh, to establish doctrine within that church and to establish leadership within that church. Um, they did other things by the authority of Christ, like cast out demons and healed the sick. Um, but God does that also through his other servants. The apostles were those that he had chosen, who had seen him, and who were to build his church, establish doctrine, establish leadership within Christ's church. Um, and then I, I want to I want to um, note that he says that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And this was important because um, there were some that actually questioned his apostleship because he was not a part of the original 12 apostles, right? Remember that Jesus, before he went to Calvary, he actually chose the 12 to be his apostles. Judah, Judas ended up betraying him. And so later on, Peter stands up, um, the, you know, at the upper room at Pentecost and says, um, you know, hey, there were there were 12 of us. Now there's only 11. We should probably choose someone else. They, they rolled some dice. Uh, picked the guy, I think his name was Matthias, um, but we never hear about that guy again. And so in my mind, I, I don't know that that was the choice of, of Christ himself. And that is why later on, um, on the road to Damascus, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of Jesus Christ, um, Jesus steps in front of Paul, knocks him off his horse and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And in that moment, Jesus stepped into the timeline of Paul's life and, and and he said, you know what, all your plans to be the greatest Pharisee, to be the greatest teacher of the law, to excel above your peers in Judaism, um, all of your plans that you had, all that's done now, and you belong to me. And, and, and I, you are my chosen vessel to, to go before Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel, and I'll show you all the things that you must suffer for my namesake. From that moment, Paul belonged to Christ heart, body, soul, and spirit. His whole heart was given over to Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and a part of being an apostle was that they were given a revelation, um, almost like a download, right, of revelation directly from Jesus Christ himself. Um, in John 14, 26, he promised to his, his disciples who would be his apostles that, that I will send the Holy Spirit to you and he will bring to your remembrance all the things that I have taught you. Um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says that he was given a, a thorn in the flesh um, to keep him from becoming conceited because of the abundance of the revelation that had been given to him. In Galatians 1, 12, um, regarding the gospel, um, Paul says, um, regarding the gospel that he preaches, I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it from rev through revelation 
through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus directly gave Paul revelation. And that was based on that, that was from where he received the information. That's where he, what he preached from. Um, and so it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It was important for him to let them know, this is the authority by which I send you this letter. Because they were facing some, some difficulties in that church. It was a new church. It was fairly healthy, um, but some dangerous ideas, some dangerous concepts, um, some heretical ideas were beginning to, to try to make their way into the church from one side on the Judaizers, from the other side, from the pagan culture around them. And so Paul's coming in and saying, listen, this is not, I'm not just Paul, the third opinion here. I'm Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus. And the doctrine that I'm about to teach you and establish within this church is the final word. And so um, y you, can, you can make all the corrections needed, um, but this is not a discussion. <laughs> this is the doctrine. Um, so he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Uh, Timothy was a disciple of Paul's. Um, Paul had met him in Lystra. He had saw something in Timothy and took him with him on the mission field. And so Timothy has, at this point, been a disciple of Paul for years on end, and Paul loves him like a son. He tells the Philippians, I have no one like him who genuinely cares uh, for your needs and for what you need, you know. Um, Paul, Timothy was a disciple of Paul, um, but he was also a pastor in his own right. Later in his ministry, he becomes a pastor of the church in Ephesus. Paul writes him First and Second Timothy while he's in Ephesus. Um, he was a missionary. He went everywhere that Paul went um, during this whole time. He was on the mission field too. He was going too. He's preaching alongside of Paul. Um, uh, but Paul doesn't introduce him as an apostle here, does he? He, had, he introduces him as Timothy, our brother. Um, that's because the apostolic authority was Paul's. It came through Paul. Christ had given this calling and this commission to Paul as an apostle of his church. So Timothy, our brother, um, Timothy was, he's introduced as Timothy as a brother. And right now, Paul begins to set up this concept of the family of God to bring this, um, to bring this idea, this, this um, picture of family, uh, a family of God into the discussion. And so he introduces Timothy, our brother. In other words, he's my brother, he's your brother, and we're brothers, right? Um, he says, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. And, and what is a saint, right? There's a lot of confusion about what that is in modern day culture. You have some who would say a saint is someone who has lived this pristine Christian life, fully committed to God. They are someone who has achieved above the ordinary. There's all these hoops that they have jumped through in their life. Maybe God performed miracles through this person and therefore they have attained to sainthood. But, but in the Bible, uh, it doesn't use the word saints in this way. The word is actually hagios and it means holy ones. Um, it it's actually could be a reference back to Daniel 7, which is an eschatological and end times section of the, the book of Daniel, where um, it says in uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Inheritance and kingdom become a big theme in this letter. And so he calls them the saints, the saints of the faithful brothers. Saints in the New Testament is, is just used interchangeably with believer. Um, so believers, followers of Christ, disciples, saints. Um, he says to the saints and faithful brothers. And this word for brothers is a Delphoi. It means brothers or sisters. It is, it is a plural word of the of the term brothers. And so he's not just talking to the men at the church in Colossae here. He's talking to um, all the believers there. So to the saints and faithful brothers. And again, this word brother is a reference to the family of God, okay? So Timothy's my brother. Timothy's your brother. You are the brothers and the sisters, right? And so we're a family. We're a family in Christ. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. I also want to let you know that this and between the word saints and faithful brothers, this is not distinguishing between two groups of people. It's not to the extra holy people there and the faithful brothers and sisters. He's saying you are saints and faithful brothers and sisters. He's saying of all who are there to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. And so their brotherhood is not in um, their ethnicity. It's not in their biology. It's not in their nationality. It's not in their racial identity. Um, it's not in any other thing but Christ. Because in Christ, we see in the Bible, neither Jew, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, for all are one in Christ. Christ abolishes those, those lines of, of difference and demarcation and separation between um, those who are his, and we become one people in Christ. Okay, so to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ, at Colossae. So he's he's sending this letter in the physical, in the real world, to this location. These are saints who are located physically in Colossae. Um, but also, I don't want to miss that he says in Christ, right? So physically, they're in Colossae. Spiritually, their location, their position is in Christ and in the kingdom of Christ. He says to the formal greeting, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Um, the word grace is the word charis in the Greek. And when he does this, he really is making a play on words because the typical Greek greeting, which would have been, it just would have meant uh, greetings, is um, kairain. Okay, and so kairain is a Greek word and it sounds similar to the word charis. And so he takes a typical Greek greeting and he just 
Christianize it. He, he imports meaning, um, theological meaning, into uh, the greeting of his letters. Grace to you, okay, and peace. And this word peace is arene in the Greek. But behind this word arene, this Greek word arene, in Paul's theology is always the word shalom. Shalom was the, the, uh, the, the greeting, both hello and goodbye, of a Jew to his um, fellow Jew, right? Shalom. And shalom was the um, eschatological hope of the Jewish people. The Messianic kingdom would bring the shalom. They say, pray for the shalom of Jerusalem. He says, grace to you and shalom from God our Father, right? And so um, part of this message here is this, that, that um, in those in Christ, they experience and receive the grace of God. Because in Ephesians 2, it says, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so when we experience the grace of God, we are transferred into the kingdom of his son. And that's when we experience the shalom of God. The shalom is part of the very nature. It's a byproduct of the very nature of God, of the kingdom of God. Okay, and so when we have received the grace from our Father God uh, because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, then along with this grace comes uh, citizenship in the kingdom of heaven and comes the shalom. And shalom is a deep word. It has very deep meaning. It means peace, yes, but it also means wholeness. It means completeness. It, it, it means tranquility. It means unity. It means oneness. It means perfection. It means purity, right? So so we receive the shalom and so this is really from an apostolic greeting this is paul grace to you by the authority of my apostleship grace to you and shalom from god our father right and i, and I don't want to miss that paul has actually left out a phrase that he uses in all his other uh, greetings where he says grace to you normally and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ here he leaves off the words and the lord jesus christ because he is staying with his theme of family why because when we are saved by christ we, we are adopted into the family of God. And this adoption is a big deal because with the adoption, we become sons and daughters of the king, sons and daughters of the kingdom. And we obtain an inheritance from our father, the inheritance of eternal life and, and, and eternal life in the kingdom of his son. And I, and I want to just look at this from the eyes of a parent right now, because as a parent, you know that the love that you have for your children is 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 unchangeable it is um just about without limit right they may enrage you they may frustrate you they may cause you to want to pull your hair out at times but the grace that you feel the grace that you have for your own child the love that you have for your own child um nothing that they do will ever make you stop loving them you'll always love your child no matter what they do um and this is the relationship that we have to god god has adopted us he loves us as a father to his son, as a father to his daughter, and our adoption papers are forever. He has adopted us, and the adoption papers are written in the blood of his own son, Christ, and they are signed in all eternity. We are adopted into the family of God, sons and daughters of the king, and we have an, obtained an inheritance of eternal life in the kingdom of his son. That's a lot for the first two verses of Colossians chapter 1.